Good morning and welcome to Keystone Church Online. My name is Lauren Foster. This is my beautiful wife, Lauren, and we pastor here at Keystone Church. And we just wanted to take a minute to let you know what you can expect here with Church Online, if, especially if this is your first time joining us. The heart of our church is to make every person feel welcome. And so part of what you'll see this morning is a glimpse into our home because we want you to feel like you've been welcomed home into our church family. And if you're encouraged or you're a part of our church family already, and you'd like to give towards supporting the vision as we advance the gospel in our community and beyond, on our website, keystonechurchpa.com, there's some different options in which you can give and support the ministry. We're so glad that you're here today and hope that this message encourages you with the hope of Jesus. Hey, thank you. Good morning, Keystone. Hey, let's do one better. Let's give Jesus some praise really quickly and thank him. Well, thank you once again. It's an honor, uh, and really I'm humbled to be here. I love every single year I get to come up here at least once a year. Just hang out with you guys and hang out with Keystone. And what I love about this church is I'll come back a year later, and I'll see some familiar faces, some people I've seen, and I'll see some new faces. And that's a sign of a healthy church when you've got both. Familiar people are sticking around and those who are coming in to check it out. It's just awesome. I love what the Fosters are doing. I love this team. They're incredible, man. They set this up, tear this down. It's just amazing what your serve teams do on a weekly basis. I've been part of churches that are set up and tear down, and I know the struggle it can be week after week, and these people truly love God. They love you and your families, and it's all reflective of the Fosters' leadership and just who they are. I've had the privilege to know the Fosters for a long time. I'll put it this way. I'm in my late 30s. I know I don't look it, but yes, I am. I'll be honest with you today. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, you know, I saw them embraces, and they saw me embrace it. So that's a long time that I have known the Fosters. And I'll tell you, the hearts that they have for people, for God, and for the church has always been the same. These are, this is just a couple who loves the Lord, who loves this area. It believes that God has a vision for Keystone Church, has a vision for this community, and they passionately serve week in and week out. And I'm honored to call them friends. Can we honor your pastors and the fosters really quickly and thank them? For those of you who don't know me, let me throw you just a little peace offering, okay, from today. I want you to know that I was born and raised in Newcastle, PA, and I live in Arkansas. I have not lived in Newcastle for a long time, but I want you to know something. I am a diehard and will always be a Steelers fan. Come on, somebody. Come on. I need some praise really quickly for the Steelers. In Arkansas, I don't ever get that. <laughs> so I just needed a little bit of that. You know, I love the Lord. I've got my family. And then a close third, just right behind the gate, is the Pittsburgh Steelers. And it's going to be a great year. Okay, I came to encourage somebody today. Um, but, you know, encouragement, I think, is, is probably the word and the term that we all need uh, as a nation. Obviously, not telling you anything you don't know after the events that took place yesterday with the presidential candidate and Donald Trump. And, man, it's just crazy. I don't, this is one of those where were you moments, I think, uh, for Americans. We had 9-11. We had even the JFK assassination attempt, all these different things, where were you? And I think that's one of those moments. And, honestly, when that happened, I remember my wife, I was actually in my hotel room. I was watching TV. I wasn't even paying attention. And I just saw a text that said Trump got shot, and I just couldn't even believe it. And I'm sure many of you, when you heard the news, there were all kinds of a range of emotions, regardless of your political ideology and where you stand. I think all of us were just shocked uh, at what we were listening to. I almost felt like it was a dream. Like, is this really happening? Did this really uh, take place? And I'm sure across the country right now, there are a lot of people who are battling with a lot of different emotions. And, you know, one thing I've noticed about social media is as soon as this stuff happens, man, people just start tweeting and posting. And I, and you know what, it's so funny because I have the same tendency. Like, I want to start texting people. Did you see so-and-so? Did you see what happened to Trump? Do all of these things. And what I realize is, is that sometimes if we're not careful, myself included, we can be spreading fear and not our faith. And us as Christians, this is a time now more than ever that we need to lean in to our faith. I believe that Romans 8, 28, I've seen it take place in my life. God works to the good. I am so, I know all of us feel this way. Regardless of American history and and all the good and evil, I am so blessed and honored to be a part of the United States of America. It has blessed my family. It has blessed my life. I've gotten to travel the world 
and see different places and see different perspectives. And I got to tell you, we are just so blessed to live where we get to live. And regardless of how evil it looks, we have to remember that this country was built on godly principles. That we didn't, when we formed this nation, we didn't look towards men, but we looked towards who we should be looking to, towards God. And we built the foundation of our country on godly principles. And God has blessed us abundantly. abundantly. But I also want to say this. I do not believe in the times where we need God most that he abandons us. And I do not believe that he's abandoned this country. I do not believe he's abandoned us. I believe now more than ever, God wants to use situations like this for the good. What the devil was trying to use to bring to vision, God wants to bring unity. And we as Christians get to be the front line of bringing unity to the people around us. How cool would it be to see people on the far left and the far right come together and be united, not under a single political candidate, but be united under somebody who can bring them hope, who can bring them peace, and his name is Jesus. Far longer, listen, far longer than the kingdom of America, the kingdom of God has been reigning for thousands of years. And so even when the kingdom of America may fall short, the kingdom of God can always step up and bring unity to the places of chaos in our lives. And just like I have seen God do it for me personally, I believe that God wants to and can do it for us nationally as well. And so we are tasked The Bible says constantly, therefore, if you stand with any encouragement, if you stand united with any encouragement from Christ, stand firm in your faith. And I think one of the first reactions that we should have as Christians, once we get ourselves settled, is we should all stop and just pray. We should put our hands together and just pray that God would be more present, that his presence would be more known than ever before in the hearts and the lives of every single American. Because now more than ever, we need the hope the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. Look at what 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 5 says. It says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all of those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved. And to come to a knowledge of the truth, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, and the man is Christ Jesus. I believe the man that we all should be looking towards right now is the one who can mediate between political differences, is the one who can mediate between chaos and evil, and his name is Jesus. So will you join me for just a moment as we take a moment just to pray, and then we're going to get right into it. Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful. I am so thankful to be a part of such an incredible nation. God, it's a blessing that I got the opportunity to live here, to be born here, to receive all of the blessings of what it means to be an American. And Father, I pray right now as disciples of Christ, God, that you would help us to be your vessels, to provide moments of peace, to be instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, God, let us sow love. Where there is injury, where there is discord, let us be united. Let us bring union. Where there is doubt, God, let us lean in to our faith. Where there is despair, God, let us be the ones through Christ Jesus who provide hope. Where there is darkness, whether in people's lives or over our nation, God, help us to be the light of Christ. Where there is sadness, God, help us to bring the joy of knowing Christ Jesus. Grant that we may not much seek to be consoled, but be used by you to console people who have a hard time understanding what is going on. Help us to not want to be understood, but to understand those who even we disagree with so that we can love them, to be loved as God loves us. For it is in giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And Father, we thank you that through Christ Jesus, we all have the opportunity to have an eternal life and to be peacemakers in our world around us. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right, well, we're in this series called Heroes, and it's exciting to think about all the different heroes of the faith. And you know what I love about the Word of God is the Word of God puts any person in there, any significant person. There is a significance to who they are. There is a significance to their story. That's why they're in the Word of God. God chose to place them there for a specific reason, whether to teach us something about human nature or to show us something about the divine nature of God, regardless when we see people in the Bible, there's a lot that we can learn. But I don't know about you, is oftentimes when I read about people in the Bible, especially heroes like David and Paul and all these people, it's kind of intimidating for me. 
to be honest. I kind of almost step back and I'm like, man, I don't know if I could do what they do. Or it feels intimidating to think to, to throw a little rock into the middle of a giant to face Goliath. All the crazy things. Daniel going down into a lion's den. I would have been crying my eyes out if I was going into a lion's den. I mean, can you think about what some of the, them did? But to be honest with you, all of the heroic things they did were not based on skill sets. We're not talking about LeBron James and how he can, his athleticism can play basketball. We're not talking about a specific skill set. Everything that the heroes in the Word of God did was all built and based around their faith. And guess what I often forget is that all of us have the opportunity to live in faith and all of us carry within us faithfulness from God, and with that, we can also do heroic things in our lives. We can be heroes of the faith today, not something that we read about that happened thousands of years ago, but I believe that today in the present, now more than ever, we can become heroes of the faith as well. And it's not based on, we learn this from David, where God says, I do not look at the physical appearance, but I look at the heart. God doesn't need us to have it all together, to have all these skill sets, to be incredibly good looking. I mean, look at me. I'm not any good looking. My wife loves me, but God still uses me because of my faith. And I want to encourage you today that God can use you regardless of what you think of yourself. God believes in you and he's given you his Holy Spirit, which means that you can do heroic things in your life. And this is why I love the hero we're going to talk about today. Because this is kind of an unsung hero that many people don't even know about, but I think he preferred it that way. And we're going to learn at the incredible impact that this man had, not just in his present time, but continuing on for generations. And his name is Barnabas. How many of you have ever heard of Barnabas in the Bible? Show of hands. Awesome. So most of you know. I want to make this clarification only for myself as well. Because when I first read this name, I thought it was Barabbas. No, Barabbas was the criminal that was on the cross next to Jesus. No, Barabbas was the criminal that got replaced, sorry, for Jesus' sake. This is not the same. Barnabas was actually first mentioned in Acts chapter 2, and he was part of when this early church really took off and began to do some things. And Barnabas was actually his nickname. His actual name was Joseph from Cyprus, and he was part of the Levite tribe. He was a Jew at the time, and he came to know the Lord. And it's amazing what he would go on to do. His name was changed because of what he would go on to do for others. Barnabas, the actual word means the son of encouragement. And nobody was able to encourage people the way that Barnabas was able to encourage. And we're going to see here what Barnabas does and how he interacts because he would go on to trans, God would use him to transform the lives of Saul to Paul, of John Mark who would write the gospel of Mark and be a disciple of Peter. He did some extremely significant things, but he did it all for the glory of God and advancing the gospel. And he did it all through something as simple as encouragement. There's not a person in here, myself included, who is not capable of encouraging the people around us. And God used this in Barnabas, in Joseph from Cyprus, to transform people's lives that would go on to transform the gospel, cities, and many generations to come. And so I'm excited because I believe that all of us can be encouragers. We're all capable in our faith to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ, to encourage people who need the encouragement. And what better time than now? to become sons and daughters of encouragement than a time that we find ourselves in as a nation as we leave today, learning from Barnabas that we can go out and begin to be the encouragers that God has called us to be. And I think there's three things that we learn from Barnabas that will teach us what it really means to be an encourager. And number one, if you're taking notes, is Barnabas was selflessly ambitious. He was selflessly ambitious. Let me show you an example of this in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 36. Look at this. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of the, their possessions was their own. Look at this. This is awesome. But they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. There were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it to the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. How awesome 
is that. And then look at this, verse 36. Think of how highly God's word is talking about the people of that time. And look at the first person that is mentioned in verse 36. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, it's one thing to own all different types of possessions, but it's another thing we know today, especially how valuable land can be. I mean, you can make a lot of money today just based off of any piece of land. And Joseph here, Barnabas, did something that, again, all of us are capable of. is just being selflessly ambitious, that he took this valuable possession. Instead of using it for his own good, he became selflessly ambitious, had this strong desire to share it with those around him. And this is an example of just how Barnabas was constantly looking for opportunities to love people and put people first. This is why he's an encourager. One of the first things that we have to do when we are encouraging others is to selflessly think about others above ourselves. It's hard for us to speak life into other people's lives when our sole focus is on us. And one of the things that Barnabas was great at was he was always looking for opportunities to pour in, to love on, whether it was possessions, whether it's with words. Some of you may say, well, I don't own a piece of land, and neither do I. But we do own our words. We do have social media accounts. We have relationships with people where we can give them the words of encouragement that they need throughout the day. But we have to be thinking and in the same mindset as Barnabas was. And there's going to be many opportunities throughout our lives where we're going to have these moments to where we can be selfishly ambitious or selflessly ambitious. And you have to be selflessly ambitious in in order to sell a piece of land. Imagine all the money that he made, and he laid it at the disciples' feet to give towards others. This is the kind of ambition towards others that I don't even carry within myself, and I'm a pastor, but it challenges me to be looking at the resources that I do have on a daily basis and saying, God, how can I build your kingdom? How can I use this to pour into others rather than to keep it to myself. And Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says it. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Look, I'm not saying if you own land that you need to leave here and sell your piece of land. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that I think all of us can get better, myself included, at being a little bit more selflessly ambitious throughout our day is looking and waking up, whether it's at our workplaces, whether it's at home with our kids or our spouses, wherever we find ourselves throughout the week, looking for opportunities to pour in and encourage others, thinking of the interests of others above ourselves. So one thing that's hard for me is that I just have a hard time believing the best. I don't know if anybody else is this way, but I really do. Some of you are smiling. You are my people, okay? Those of you who struggle with this, but I just have noticed I can be very cynical. One of the things that Barnabas did so well, and again, I love this about Barnabas. These things made him heroic. It placed him in the word of God, but they're very simple things that we can do on a regular basis. And number two is Barnabas believed the best in others. And I'm going to show you this. He believed the best in others. Some of you have heard of believing the best. It's a love scripture in 1 Corinthians where it says we must believe the best in one another. Well, Barnabas did this, and I'm going to show you two examples, and we're going to talk about it. The first one is in Acts chapter 9, verse 26. Now, you're going to be familiar with who he does this to, but look at this in verse 26. When he came to Jerusalem, this is, he's talking about Saul here, not Paul, but Saul. He tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul, now remember, God had just on his journey here with Damascus, this would become Paul, but he was still Saul in this moment, had seen the Lord, the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So because of Barnabas' help, Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. Okay, we need to understand for context, historical context, before Paul was Paul, he was Saul. And Saul's main mission was to go around and to actually execute and kill people like Barnabas. Anybody who believed in this, what they called this movement of Christ in the early times, Saul was on the front lines going out and brutally executing and murdering Christians who believed in the faith. So no wonder we see in Acts chapter 9, here comes Saul. And the disciples, even the apostles, 
were afraid of him, thinking this guy was just out here killing and murdering the very people that now he says he's a part of. I'm going to be real with you. With my cynicism, there's no way I would have believed Saul. I'm just going to be honest with you. If Saul had just come off killing and murdering Christians, and now he comes, he walks up, hey, I'm a Christian now. I love God. I mean, come on, let's just be honest. How many of you would be like, oh, yeah, brother, give me a hug? You know, like, we wouldn't do that, right? We would be skeptical. We would take a step back. I know for me, this tends to be my default, if I'm honest is I tend to believe the worst in others before I believe the best in anyone. And what Barnabas shows us here is right off the bat, before Saul did any of the good work, any of the credible work of the Lord, Barnabas believed the best and even defended Saul, even when he was in his sin. Now, what does that sound like to you? That sounds like Jesus. How many times do we see Jesus standing in the way of people's sin? Jesus standing in the way when someone is called evil, when someone was called a sinner, Jesus stood in the gap for that person and defended the value of that intrinsic value of the soul that was before them. And so here is Barnabas doing something simple. People are rightfully afraid of Saul. He has earned that fear. But instead of Barnabas joining in in the fear, he chose to lean into his faith, like the word of God says, like Jesus had taught him and stand in the gap and believed the best in Saul, when Saul probably didn't have anybody, whether it was the people he was with killing the Christians he had left, or he was in this weird in-between. And Barnabas, just like 1 Timothy says, became the mediator for Saul, just like Christ Jesus is the mediator for us and mankind. And then the second example here is in Acts chapter 15. Look at this. Sometime later, now Saul is Paul. Look at this. So Barnabas, this is fascinating, defends Saul. He now becomes Paul. He's living in it. And look at this. Let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark. This is John Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark with them. But Paul did not think it was wise to take him because, look at this, he had to, isn't it fascinating that not even Saul, Barnabas stood up for Saul, and now Paul is even against somebody because of what they did. And look at Barnabas again. John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. So he deserted them, rightfully so. They had such a sharp disagreement, they parted company. Barnabas, look at this, took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of God. He went through Syria and Sicily, strengthening the churches. If it wasn't for Barnabas believing in the best and standing in the gap for Saul, we may have never seen the Paul he would become. And on top of that with John Mark, once again here, here's a situation where Barnabas is standing in the gap, not subtweeting about John Mark or Saul, but standing in the gap and defending them, not because of what they've done, but because of what Christ Jesus has done for him and for them. Oftentimes, it's hard to believe the best in somebody when you don't have anything in their life to look at to see that could tell you or provide hope. And see, here's the thing is most of the time when people are in these hopeless situations is a perfect time like Barnabas to be the provider of hope for them in their life. Sometimes people are coming to church or people are even coming to you or coming to work and they feel hopeless in their life. They feel abandoned in many ways and they rightfully so. They, maybe they've made consequences and choices in their life. But just like Jesus did and Barnabas did, we have to believe the best in others. I believe there are many situations every single day where we can provide hope for people when they have hopeless situations around them. And this is a time we see once again that Barnabas, two different situations, what you think about this, where Barnabas chose to believe the best in someone. Think about it, even when good people around him believed the worst. Notice the people who fought against Barnabas. These were fellow Christians, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. This was Saul and now Paul. Even Paul, the one that Barnabas had stood in the gap for, was now trying to be uh, against what Barnabas was doing. It's fascinating to me that Barnabas stood in the way, not of sinners and other sinners, but of Christians and sinners, that he stood in the gap for people. And it's far easier for me, I'm just going to be honest, to believe the worst and to dismiss. This is why mainstream media doesn't lead with good news. It leads with bad news. Because there's just a part, there's a cynicism in all of us 
that is just part of our nature and part of who we are. We have a hard time trusting anyone. Especially with the internet today, you see so many people getting, I mean, if you go on X right now, all the different, just seeing the shots, Trump getting shot at, it just builds this anxiety. It makes you build this cynicism on the inside of you, and it's already within us. So this is a really difficult thing to believe the best in someone when you can't see the best in them yet. No one knew Paul was going to become the man of God that he was. Nobody knew that John Mark was going to go from deserting God to uplifting and writing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Barnabas might not have even known, but he knew he had to stand in the gap for those sinners just the way that Jesus not only stood in the gap for them, but also stood in the gap for him. I love what 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says. This is the message translation, and this is true. This is a challenge for me. Is love always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. It always looks for the best. Imagine if we were just a group of people that no matter how dark things looked, we always chose to talk about the light. That no matter how difficult and evil things may look, we always look for the hope and the good. I'll tell you, now is a perfect time as people were talking about all of the craziness, and you're going to start hearing conspiracy theories. I mean, come on. Those are coming. Those happen seconds after it happened. You're going to hear all of these different conspiracy theories and be all of this talk. All of this darkness is going to start to fill over. It's going to feel like this cloud of, I don't know, unknowns, darkness, fear, all of these things. And we can choose to step into faith. We can choose to step in and be the light that God has called us to be. Be the light, a city on a hill that God has called us to be. And what a better time to do that than to right now. Not just looking for the best in others, but also looking for the best in the future of our nation moving forward, believing that God's very best is still ahead of us. Number three, this is my last point, is Barnabas fought for the salvation of others. Barnabas fought for the salvation of others. Up until this point, there are two things that Barnabas loved that we know. He loved the gospel and he loved people. But there was a point in large where both came under attack. Look at Acts chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. So listen to this. Circumcision, I'm not going to tell you what that means. If you don't know, look it up on your own time. Uh, But there were many Jews. Now remember, Barnabas was a Jew. He was part of the Levite tribe. Many Jews who came to know Christ, part of the old covenant was that people had to be circumcised in order to become believers, to become part of the nation of Israel. Well, now it became a spiritual birthright through Jesus Christ. So it no longer was required for people to be circumcised, but yet many Jews still held on to that old tradition. And of all people who knew it, Paul and Barnabas knew it because they were both Jews themselves. And look at this. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some leaders to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. Here again, we see Barnabas. He wasn't defending an ideology. He wasn't defending himself because he was a circumcised Jew. But here again, another situation where Barnabas is standing in the gap for others. Standing in the gap from people who even are very different from him. Jews did not believe that Gentiles were saved because they did not commit the ceremonial law like circumcision. This obviously was not the gospel, since it wasn't a physical covenant, but a spiritual covenant. The nation of Israel, which was determined through physical birthright and circumcision, was now a spiritual birthright, that a rebirth that was displayed, just like Jesus taught to Nicodemus, that we are reborn in Christ. And it's fascinating that Barnabas, who had an opportunity to jump on the bandwagon in this moment, to get with the Jews and to put somebody down. He chose to sit in the gap along with Paul and fight for those who needed hope and needed somebody to fight for them. Have you ever been yourself in a situation where you needed somebody to fight for you? Maybe there are some times in your life that you don't even realize where people are fighting for your salvation. I remember moments in my 20s. This was, this was my, B, I call it my BC days, before Christ days. And they were before Christ, let me tell you. I won't get into it all, but I just, I was out there. And there were people, my parents included, who were still fighting for me, praying for me on a consistent basis, fighting for the salvation in my life. They never gave up on me. They never turned from me. But they continued to stick up and fight and pray for me throughout it. And I believe I wouldn't be standing here today if there weren't people at different times and different points who stood in the gap like Jesus has mediated for all of us and represented Jesus Christ in my life. And here's the exciting part, 
is you have the opportunity every single day to stand in the gap for somebody in your life. There may be somebody who is mocking Jesus, who is doing all kinds of evil, and instead of pointing at them and and cursing them for their evil, we can provide hope and encouragement and even stand in the gap for them. Be a defender. You know, oftentimes when people are doing evil things, it's because they feel unloved. They don't feel like anybody cares. They feel like people have dismissed them. You know, when the world puts labels on us, it always has to do with our sinfulness. I won't even name some of the labels because they're not worthy to even be said in church. But you know what I'm talking about. Typically, when the world labels you with a name or a nickname, it's based off of sinfulness. But what I love about the Word of God is any time the Word of God gives a nickname to somebody, it's because of God's holiness. And Barnabas had God's holiness because he simply was a defender of people's souls. He fought for the gospel. He put the gospel and others above himself. And what I love about his heroism, what I love about Barnabas, is all of us in this room are capable of doing that. Every single one of us are capable of standing in the gap for the gospel, of standing in the gap for a soul. We all have the ability to encourage, to defend, and to selflessly love the people around us every single day. And God has given us this ability, and Barnabas has shown us how he has stood in the gap for people throughout his life. Many different situations. I'm thankful for all the people who stood in the gap for me and for my salvation. And I believe that we now have the same opportunity to become a son and daughter of encouragement. And so how do we do that? What does this look like for each and every one of us? And I want to give all of us, myself included, a challenge For the next week, if you want to take notes, if you want to take a picture of this and put it on your phone, I want to encourage all of us that this is what we're going to do for the next week. Number one is we're going to encourage someone without getting anything in return. You know what I have noticed? This is just me, but (laughs) I'll just be honest. Is that when I do something nice for somebody, I kind of look around like, is anybody watching? (laughs) I don't know if anybody else does that. You know, like like if you even if you pay it forward. For like Starbucks or whatever, you kind of want the cashier to be like, oh, that was really nice of you. That was really, you know, like we, we kind of sometimes we do things and we're kind of looking to our right and to our left like, does anybody know this? Does anybody? Know? I want us to encourage people, encourage anybody in your life every single day without getting or telling anybody about it. You know what I loved about Jesus is every time he healed somebody, the first thing he said was don't go tell anyone. And the reason why he did that was because he was trying to dodge the glory that even the credit that it came from. He didn't want people to look at the man, but he wanted people to look towards God and towards Jesus as a Savior. So we should be not looking for validation and credit when we do things. We should just be doing things out of the goodness of our heart. And so that's me. I'm not, I'm, this time I'm going to pay it forward. I'm going to look at the cashier when I do it. <laughs> but I want to challenge all of us. Let's encourage someone without getting anything in return. Number two is speak to someone's potential or confidence. Maybe every single day while, you know, while you're getting ready or whatever, just send out a text. Maybe call somebody on your drive to work or your drive home from work and just speak into their life. Find somebody who you feel like maybe is lost. Maybe it's a family member who is just lost right now. They're troubled. There seems like there's a lot of darkness. Call them and encourage them. Just say, hey, God loves you. God believes in you. Can I, how can I be praying for you? What can I do for you? Some way that you can stand in the gap to show them the hope, love, and mercy of Jesus Christ. And number three, is let's take 10 minutes a day of prayer for those who are lost. One of the best ways that we can fight for the salvation of others is through the power of prayer. God has equipped all of us with the ability to pray, and even how intimidating it may be. The Bible says when two or three gather, like it is right now, or when we go in to pray, that God goes into action into people's lives. And one of the great ways every single day to allow the holiness and the godliness to get into people's hearts and minds It's just through the power of prayer. So I want to challenge all of us in this room, man. Let's take some time to encourage somebody without getting anything in return. Let's speak to someone's potential or raise someone's confidence through a text or a phone call. And, man, let's take 10 minutes, just 10 minutes, whether it's in our cars, instead of me listening to the herd or whatever sports analyst I'm going to listen to, I can spend 10 minutes praying for those who are lost. With heads bowed and eyes shut, you guys were awesome today. I mean, maybe you yourself feeling a little discouraged and you're battling some areas of your life. And I'm glad you came to church today. You may, your life may feel chaotic. You may feel discouraged. You may just simply be discouraged because of what happened yesterday. Well, you came to the right place because here is where we can receive the encouragement of Christ. It's here at church where we can find 
the unity, the harmony that we can all carry through the gospel that comes through knowing Jesus Christ. I believe that every single one of us has the ability to be not only a son and daughter of Christ, but a son and daughter of encouragement. And so if you're out here today with nobody looking around and you say, you know, Caleb, I could just use some prayer, use some encouragement in my life. Go ahead and lift up your hand so I can pray with you. Nobody looking around. I just want to pray for you. Yeah, I see him. I see him. You say, I just just need some encouragement. What I love about the Lord is I, I can, God can use me as a vessel. I don't even need to know what's going on in your life, but just praying over you, I know God's going to go into action. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to be the example, to be the mediator in all of our lives. God, we're thankful that Jesus showed us what it means to stand in the gap for somebody's soul, that we have heroes like Barnabas who teach us how to be not only defenders of the faith, but defenders of people who oftentimes need in moments of their life to be defended. They need to be encouraged. And God, you've given all of us that ability. So Father, I just encourage the person in the room. Whatever darkness is over their life, whatever they're struggling with, whatever sin, whatever's happened to them, God, the Bible says, Jesus says, do not grow weary, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Father, I believe that through Jesus Christ, they can overcome any darkness that they find in their life. Father, I pray for any lies that have been rooted in their heart. We rebuke them in Jesus' name. May it be replaced with your truth, with the love and the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you in advance for the freedom, for the peace, and the hope that's going to come out of any darkness that we find in our lives. And we thank you for those. Nobody looking around, if you're out here today and you'd like to receive Jesus for the first time, you say, Caleb, I've been lost for some time. I really want to have this relationship with God. Or maybe you've just fallen far away from God. You say, I want to put him back in the center of my heart and my life. If that's you, nobody looking around, go ahead and lift up your hand for me. There's nobody looking around. I see it. I see it. Awesome. Okay, one more time as I look across the room. I see him. I see him. You can put him down. I just want to encourage you to quietly do at your seat. You can repeat after me or you can pray your own prayer, but I want to encourage you. This isn't a conversation between me and you. This is a conversation between you and God, and let it come from your heart. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. And God, today, we come before you to say we've messed up, to ask for forgiveness. God, we first ask you to forgive us, then we ask you to take center stage of our heart and our life. God, from this day forth, we are committing to loving you first and to loving others the way that you love us. God, help us in this time to be encouragers, and to be the lovers of God and his will. We thank you for all of these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Hey, church, can we put our hands together and celebrate all that God did today?